All right, hello everyone, and welcome back to another edition of The Less Stress Life, where we teach exhausted and burnt out adults the truth about adrenal fatigue so that they can get their health back quickly. And I'm joined with a friend, a colleague, even a mentor, and someone I always look forward to talking to. This is actually our third conversation for our podcast, Dr. Kelly Halderman. She's a researcher, she's an author, she's a clinician, she's a nutraceutical formulator, she's the dean of students. I don't know how she has all the time to do all this. She's also a mom and a, a business person and everything else in between. So Dr. Kelly, welcome to the show once again. Thank you, Dr. Joel. Awesome to be here for number three, third time. Yes, to actually, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm excited for the topic because you sort of whispered in my ear the, the idea of empathy and how that relates to people that are exhausted and burnt out. And we, this is a switch of pace from what we've talked about with Detox 2.5 uh, or, and also talking about utilizing fat and bile movement and all of the above. So why don't you start with why, how you got started into or what triggered you to put this on your radar for empathy and, and how it relates to health? Sure. So honestly, I am really not what I would consider a touchy feely empathic person at all. I feel like I, um, you know, mothering didn't come easy to me. Relationships don't really come easy to me. And I've always had to work really hard to be like what I've always thought of as, as empathic, you know, and some people are really blessed at, they're just so empathically wonderful and they can really be loving, nurturing, caring people. And I just think that's amazing, but we're not all gifted at everything. So I'll start off by saying like, this is not my avenue. This is not something that I would say, oh, uh, you know, I'm going to read books on em empathic people. You know, we've all heard about this. Empathy is part of life and having empathy for people. And that's something that I had. But it wasn't until I met a brilliant practitioner who's been helping me with some neural retraining. And it had to do with my adrenal fatigue and my chronic fatigue and some of the symptoms that I literally have been struggling with for decades, right? And she said to me, she, we, we got to know each other as a you know practitioner and kind of as a, as a friend as well. She said to me about a month ago, maybe a little bit more, Kelly, I think that you're an empath. And I thought, what? Like, I, I am, I'm not an empath. Like, I, like everything I just said, right? It's very hard. She goes, I think you need to read the work of Dr. Judith Orloff, O-R-L-O-F-F, -F, M-D. So she is a psychiatrist who writes about empaths and things. And I and so, okay, all right, I'm open to it, right? Whatever, whatever will fix my, the fatigue, right? Like I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm there, I'm doing really well, my health's great, but I'm like, okay. So I start reading a Dr. J Dr. Judith's work and lo and behold, she has this huge connection between the symptoms, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, anxiety, depression with being an empath. And so there's a questionnaire and uh, about being an empath. And so, um, you know, I really suggest to your listeners that, that it's something that you can, you can actually do it for free uh, looking her up, but, you know, going through the questionnaire, um, Dr. Joel, I think that's maybe where we can, should kind of start is kind of looking at like, what do you think of as an empath? Because I didn't think I was at all. And then I took this questionnaire and I'm like, oh my gosh, I am. And how it plays into health. And I want to talk to you, Dr. Joe, I'm going to turn the mic up or you around because this is exactly what I think of as genetic susceptibility. You know, when we have those genetic um, tests and, and they're completely different, you know, let's say like two people have Lyme disease and one's genetics are just a mess and the others are pretty darn good. So who's going to display the symptoms? Who's gonna, it's the person whose genetics have not been optimized, right? This is the same thing with an empath who has not learned to, to, to optimize themselves because being an empath is absolutely amazing. We have abilities and abilities to tune in, but it can take you down. I mean, literally it can take you down. And I, I will tell a quick story is that when I was, when I was rounding in hospitals with my white coat on going into hospital rooms, I would literally walk out feeling the feelings of people who were sick. And I was like, to my colleagues, like, does anybody else feel like they've been completely wiped out by like the stress, the trauma though? I mean, when I was working in the ICU, 
I remember not being able to like walk into some of these rooms because it would just take me down and that was just my normal. So um, I'm going to, I'm just going to kind of go into some of these questions and we're going to, we'll have a dialogue about it. So the questionnaire, which again can be found on her website is, are you overly sensitive, shy, or introverted? So there's 20 questions, right? And you don't have to answer yes to all of them. But if you score like somewhere between 15 and 11, you definitely are an empath. You, if you score less than that, you have empathic things. But across the board, one of the um, most important things that, that I've learned is that even, you know, again, with this questionnaire is that women who are, who are empathic, it's really important because we gravitate toward being the caregiver, being um, actually, you know, more of a codependent that we burn out, we burn out. So again, protecting ourselves. So again, like overly shy or introverted. Yes, I've been introverted and I felt bad about that, but that's just part of who, you know, who I am. Um, do you overwhelm or cry easily? Do arguments or yelling make you ill? Do you not feel like you fit in? Um, are you overstimulated? Now here's kind of the interesting physiology we're gonna go through. Are you overstimulated by noise, smells, or if one of the questions is nonstop talkers? chemical, do you have chemical sensitivity? So it's funny, and I'm going to ask you this, is that we see chemical sensitivity, right, in our practices. And everybody is so physiologically, and so was I, when we talked about phase 2.5, I'm like, well, let's get the bile flowing. Let's get that flowing. But in your practice, do you see a correlation between women who are the caregivers, who are, you know, have been, who put themselves second and then you see these symptoms and then you're, you're helping to change their physiology, but they're still having symptoms. Do you see that in your practice? Yeah. I mean, there are so many, so many other areas that have to be considered as well. Like just, I think the, the main point Kelly is, is that if you're an empath, then you have a speaker system that's amplified, right? And mm -hmm. so, or you have receptors that are amplified and because in today's day and age, there are so many triggers or stimuli that would amplify, that would just at least hit the receptors, let alone if they're that much more amplified. So the answer is yes, um, but, but with the idea that there are so many different variables and stimuli to have to process on a daily basis. And when you combine that with having the propensity to be much more impacted by that and it's amplified, then that creates the difficulty of moving the needle because you're doing all these great supplements, you're doing testing, you're understanding your genetics, but you're missing the glue that could make the difference between actually feeling a lot better. And that's what you can talk about now. So as far as maybe going into the questionnaire, like, so you have the questionnaire and again, I'll post for the listeners on yeah, my website, um, the name and, and the link to be able to get to that. But so, so, okay. So that you were working with a, a colleague who kind of put it on your radar and, and you were like, no way, but then you delved more into it and saw that there's this questionnaire and, and you did exemplify the characteristics of being an empath. So then what, like what, what was your next, what happened then? Sure. So then, so then I started to think about my life and I started to think about some of the things that empaths do to suppress all the energy coming at them. Right. And so for some people it's food, for some people it's shopping, sex, uh, you know, any sort of substances, because that will turn off that will turn off that that emotional that we feel. And I think to myself, how many people have problems losing weight? Well, it could be because they're putting that on and Judith Orliff will say this, Dr. Orliff will say, they put it on as padding to try and like protect themselves. And I'm like, you're never gonna be able to get rid of you know that weight or let's say you're, an, and this actually happens with a lot of empathic males with addiction is that they've been they they've been trained because of our society to suppress that that sensitive side oh you can't be sensitive you know man up so then what they do is that they 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 turn to substances so that dr judah talks about how many people in her practice are empaths that are actually addicted to substances because they're they can't they can't manage like they can't manage i will be just completely honest with you and i told you this joel when we were talking about this I cannot go to a social event without having a couple drinks because I, 
it is completely overwhelming to me. So I have learned that in the, in, and I, now that I'm aware of this, I'm like, wow, I need to, I can't use alcohol to, to block myself. I need to use positive practices, which I've implemented, which have helped me be a better mom, a better clinician, a better everything. And we'll get into those. Um, but really it's, it's just looking at how we cope and why we cope. Why are we doing some of these things that we're doing? My adrenals were flatlined. I mean, like we're flatlined. And I feel like, because I never was taught the strategies to, per, to, to optimize, to optimize myself again. And I think that probably rings true with so many of your listeners, like they're burnt out. They're totally burnt out. But like, let's say, let's say you live with an energy vampire. Let's say you live with a stressful situation because that's one of the questionnaires. Does arguments or do, you know, conflict, does that, does that drain you? Because that's just keeps happening to me in my life is that if I don't, if I don't protect my energy, if I don't protect and be around in an environment or just simply just sit down and think about what situations make your adrenal fatigue worse, what situations, you know, and, instead of like, which supplement am I, you know, what, what did I eat? What, you know, like, literally, are you around someone? who is draining your, your, your physical energy? Is, is that someone, you know, I, I know I don't really like that term energy vampire, but we all know one. And some of us are super sensitive to them. Some other people are not sensitive at all. And that's fine. Like I know a billion people who are not sensitive whatsoever. So again, like take an inventory of like how you, how you feel. So that's where it started for me, Joel. It was like, okay, in my life, like where was I, when was this chronic fatigue hitting me? Like, boom. Well, it was actually after some emotional, um, uh, conflict, it, you know, the emotional conflict, I felt like I was just taking it on. And, and of course, like I was just tired and stuff. And I actually have a son. My middle son is actually what I've identified as an empath. He takes on the energy of anybody who's around him. And so it's like, it's very important for me then as a mother, to make sure, like, he's just, you know, you think like, well, why are you so upset or anything? Well, then if you dig into it, you know, so again, practicing this or just even having a, a conversation or anything with your children or better to identify that, you know, is really important. Yeah, you know, and, and what I think about one of the, we where we first met was such a fortuitous seminar. I had no anticipation of having lifelong friends and lessons from that particular seminar. But remember, um, Patrick Porter was there and with the brain tap, which we both love. And one of the things that stuck with me with what he said was if you look at the Vietnam vets or even just any uh, PTSD soldier that's been overseas and then they come back to a life that's like a drop in the bucket to how frenetic the life was in, in, in war. And, and the constant stress. And so what they would do is because their body in, in, a, in, a, in a weird way becomes, I won't so much say addicted, but tolerant to those brain chemicals that are the fight or flight chemicals. And there's such a disparity between how much they were pumping for so long and how the cells and the receptors and the physiology molds to that to now when they're in normal life, they, they can't cope with the, the such a big drastic change. And then unfortunately, like, so sadly there's suicides and then there's recidivity rates of increasing in, in dependency and drugs. And when you were telling me about the, the just when you were talking about the, the, the potential to be an empath where that's where these coping mechanisms that aren't healthy, when you have so much stimuli that you're processing that are amplified, that are, are multi-focused, and you want to, um, you have a discrepancy between that and, and how that physiologically is impacting your body, you need to fill in the gap with ruinous behaviors potentially. And that could be addictive behaviors, you know, pornography, that can be shop, anything that you put, uh, you know, a, a, a holic to, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. is probably um, one of those things that is a good sign that you have 
a, a physiology, physiological imbalance between how much you, you've processed in the past and having to titrate down like any person coming off of a drug needs to do. And it's going to be painful to a certain extent, but it starts with awareness for sure, because who knows who, who even thinks about the, this term, let alone that it's them, and then the domino effect that it has. And ultimately, we're talking about exhausted and burnt out individuals that don't handle stress well. Um, I'm the same way. I, if I, I'm an introvert, I go to a party and I, I, I would rather just sort of be you know, off to the side and, and not talking to anyone. And they're like, okay, it's time to go. And it's only been an hour, you know, and stuff like that. So, so, okay. So then from there, so you raise the awareness um, as far as what makes someone more likely, Kelly, is there genetic susceptibilities? Yeah. What's the, why would someone be an introvert? Well, I mean, not an introvert, a, um, an a yeah, an empath. Yeah. So what makes it worse is I, number one, not being aware of it and what we just talked about using all these extraneous things to try and blunt it it actually backfires and you end up sick the the body doesn't lie the body keeps score right so i mean that's kind of number one number two is blood sugar imbalances and this is from the work of dr judah orliff these are this is studies i mean so when i'm rattling these off this isn't just my observation so blood sugar imbalances how important it is and how sensitive empaths are to, to any sort of undulation in blood sugar. And you know, you've done amazing education and work on this, Dr. Joel. So listen to a different podcast for all that information. And then um, sleep. So if you're not, if you're not taking care of your sleep, you're more susceptible. Um, if you have poor time management, if you know you're you're all over the place, because as empaths, we tend to like to, uh, we tend to gravitate toward multitasking, but actually do better when things are just methodical, like one, a one by one. I know that when, you know, when I was racing around in, as a medical doctor in the emergency room, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I like one thing at a time. So that really wasn't where I fit in the best. Um, nature, if you're not getting out in nature, if you're not grounding yourself, uh, you know, if you're if you're not taking the time to just get off your phone, um, it, you know, like I'm kind of preaching to myself at this point. Um, that's really really important. Setting clear boundaries with people, which is very uncomfortable for me. I'd rather be like, yes, I can do everything. Um, learning to practice. If you suck at set, setting boundaries with people, practice. Just practice. You're worth it. You're worth just setting some boundaries and saying no. No is a complete sentence. You don't have to. You don't have to say anything more. You, you just say no. You're, you know, like I, I. think these are important things for, for, for especially for adrenal burnout, right? I mean, we're we're just running on on empty. Um, and then breathing, meditation, little kind of you know breathing exercises is important. What I thought is really interesting um, was that empaths can actually wash off. Some of like that burden, that emotional burden, by getting into water. I am a bath person. Like I am like, get me in. Oh, I need to call them. I'm like, get me in a bath or get me in the ocean. How many of us crave that? And that can be because we're empaths, or you know. And, and again, it's not like I am a pet empath or I'm not. You know, it's not black and white. It's like I think we should all just kind of learn these skills. But um, and then drinking water. So those are all the things that can really take you down and make you susceptible or bring you back like nature and breathing and all these things which are important for everyone and um specifically judith orloff says uh, lavender oil on the third eye uh i just am a fan of lavender oil i think it's quite medicinal so those are kind of some of the strategies yeah no those, those are great Go, just to you know positive practice blood sugar and balance uh, and and i think what you're saying is when it's not staying stable you're, you're much more likely to have those highs and those lows and have less discipline for boundaries and, and so forth, um, which I would also elaborate to the fact that when a circadian rhythm is off, you're going to be more um, susceptible to the tendencies of being empathic, um, which also falls into sleep. Disorganize is huge. I, I think that um, going about 
your business in an organized way and having a to-do list. And, you know, I was listening to a Dr. Bob Miller lecture the other day. And when he looks at the, you can talk about the, the genetic predisposition with the gene snip there. He says that a lot of people that have those potentials, he'll tell them that, hey, listen, this is what you have. You have more of a potential to be an empath and and not get into an hour conversation like we are, but he'll, he'll tell them like, perhaps people sense this in you and potentially take advantage of you or lean on you. And you're, you have to be aware that you have this potential and it's okay to say no, because ultimately it's the doctor's orders. It's a prescription for just like you would take something to help with high blood pressure or low blood pressure saying no and knowing your boundaries are really, really key for sure. Um, I think that's, that's important. Uh, knowing, knowing like, and, and that's a problem too, Kelly, when you have all of this chaos going on, um, it will jumble up that front part of the brain. And that's where you don't have that sequential planning, um, step one, step two, step three, and then you don't have even the motivation or the goals or what you want to accomplish in life. Cause I'll ask people like, Hey, like, if we were to fix this and, and you were to be feeling better, what would you do? Like, what's your bucket list of things you'd want to do? And they're like, I don't even know. I'm like, well, that's unacceptable. Like, I, no, I'm not mad at you, um, but it's part of your, your therapy. Like in functional neurology, what they can't do is part of the treatment protocol, right? Like if you can't do balance, you have to work on your balance. If you can't follow like pursuits or saccades, you gotta you gotta follow the pursuits or saccades. If you can't organize your brain in sequential steps, you gotta do that. So I, I would even put there as well that that's a perfect storm of it just becomes a vicious cycle, right? Because if you have all these things happening that are are you're not aware of and that are being impacted by the first domino effect, and then those next dominoes knock down those next dominoes knock down the first domino and then it becomes this domino effect. Would you agree on that? I would totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. And I, I love that what Dr. Bob said about, you know, the susceptibility and Joel and I both share heterozygosity in the OXTR. And it actually surprised me because I've met Dr. Joel in person and he, it's almost like some, they, Dr. Orloff says some empaths, they, they look like they have a sign on their, their head that says, tell me everything. Like, right. just tell me, like, I, I barely knew Joel. And I was like, he just is a great aura, just this great, you know, natural, like you, you, you I, so for him not to be the, uh, you know, homozygous, uh, you know, empath. So again, G genetic susceptibility. It's not, it's not, I'm again, I, you know, I would expect that I would be more of a two. And then I've seen people with this genetic snip where, they're, um, they're, they're two, they have both of the SNPs, um, but yet they're icy. <laughs> I mean, like they're totally icy. So, um, you know, it is, it is important to, again, look at our genetics and just see our predispositions. But again, if you're someone who people feel like they meet you on the street corner and they can tell you your life story, you might, you just might be, they might feel that like you're open and that you're receptive. But again, we just have to learn some practices, um, to help shield, shield that and, in, in direct it in a good way. Yeah, I mean, so so just to pick up from where you were letting off, um, so the OXTR uh, is a gene uh, SNP that if it's mutated, it's one parent, it, that's called heterozygous, and that's going to have more of a potential to, to amplify the signals um, that are coming in. But you know what it makes me think about, Kelly, is, you know, when we think about uh, the kinetics of genes, meaning how fast or slow those genes work. And what makes it so difficult is some gene SNPs are upregulated and some are downregulated, um, which now throws a lot of loops into, okay, is this working too fast or is this working too slow? But we usually say, well, it's not as bad because it's a one, only one parent gave it to you. And really it's worse when it's a two. I think we can use the OXTR personally as a testament that it doesn't like being a little pregnant and being a lot pregnant <laughs> is being pregnant, right? Whether you're yeah. a little pregnant or a lot pregnant, you're pregnant. So if you have ones in other locations, 
don't necessarily think that it's a bad, it's not as bad a thing. It, it can really express, even if it's not a two. Um, and then most importantly, like we were talking about before we started this, is it's the environmental gene SNPs that make, make even worse. Meaning it, a gene SNP is when the example I always use, Kelly, is just the credit card processing machine, the old style ones. You put the card in, you swipe it out, and now you have a copy. And I just would come up with, if you have one gene SNP, it's like for every 10 swipes, eight swipes are good, you know, and two are not good. So now you don't have a sale in your store because you didn't, right? But if, if you have two SNPs, it's maybe four or five. And that's not a great example in terms of that's exactly how it works, but it, it does show you that, well, now for every 10 swipes, if I have two copies, only the card goes in sideways, it doesn't get read properly, and now I only have four or five. Um, but the whole point is, is that the perfect storm is not only that, but the door's locked and people can't get in, people forgot their credit card in the first place. And the analogy for that would be the epigenetic overlapping variables like you work in a job where you're a, a, most people have employment in the service related industry and in the health related industry i remember literally telling myself when i came home at the end of the day having a shower and washing it off i need to wash it off right because it's too overstimulating for me um, so so epigenetic perfect storms are not only having the potentials genetically, even if it's a one, and even if it's a zero, um, and no parents had it, because the environment from all the stimuli, your jobs, your post-traumatic stressors, um, so many things. So what have you found in terms of what are some of the major epigenetic overlapping perfect storms? Oh, well, um, definitely, I, I think kind of to, to go back one, and then I'll come back to that question, is that it's imperative that we look at our genetic susceptibilities. It is absolutely imperative to get your body physiologically running the best it can. And I think that's why I've had so much success with my health and overall uh, just, just gain you know, so much is that I optimize my metabolism, I optimize my detox, I optimize all that. And then it was like, and here's what's left over. You know what? And I'm constantly doing that. It's not like a one and done, right? I know my genetic susceptibilities. I know, and that was just priceless. Um, Joel has helped me optimize my, my genetics as well. So, you know, that's a piece, right? But I'm not saying like jump over all that, you know, and don't detox yourself and, you know, don't pay attention to your MTHFR. Like, I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying like, do that. And at the same time, like implement this in, implement in, you know, the epigenetic factors, which play a role in everything that, you know, it's just, it's just foundational. So again, we talked about sleep optimization. Um, we talked about, um, we actually didn't talk about, but exercise, exercise, movement of the body. I mean, dopamine stimulation, really getting, uh, you know, your body movement going can really help protect you. Uh, whether you're an empath or not, right? So these are just kind of, they're kind of they play over over ev everyone and everything. So um, and we talked about uh, you know boundary setting, meditation, quiet time. Um, I always have felt really guilty about needing quiet time, and really felt guilty about coming home at the end of the day, seeing so many patients, and just feeling it all, and going like wow, this is a lot when there are people that's not, that's not typical. Right. And that's, that's not, um, but I think that, again, I think we're speaking to a group here with adrenal fatigue. We're going to be like, yes, like I totally get that. So, um, there's an exercise where if you feel a uh, negative energy, you, you just say return to sender. That's been really actually very helpful, very, um, easy to do, but just like, I'm starting to feel this, like, I don't, you know, I'll, I'll just return to center, just take that energy back. There's a practice um, of the golden shield bubble exercise. Sounds a little hokey, but really, you know, just set your intention, set your intention to, you know, keep your positive energy and, you know, not take on, you can listen, you can be there for, um, you know, people, but like not take it on personally. And that's kind of like that, the difference. Um, again, I think um, a diet, we talked about blood sugar, really, really making sure that you're uh, optimizing that. And again, Joel, you're like the go-to doctor. I, you know, if I have anything issues like with that or questions with that, but that's kind of like in a nutshell, what, um, 
to answer your question about the epigenetic. Yeah, no, that's great. So, so I'm just going to kind of paraphrase what you said as well and put my spin on that. So I agree with you. I think that everyone should have a functional genomic assessment just to get an idea what your major hiccups or challenges could be raw, like from the raw data alone, not from epigenetic stuff. Um, just like, hey, there's bipolar runs in the family or autoimmunity is running the family or cardiovascular challenges run in the family yeah, or depression. Yeah, right, I want to yeah. know that. Um, but you're right. Like I think foundationally, I always tell people less is more. Like if we can pay your expenses, if we can help with good absorbing of nutrients and good um, utilization of nutrients and we can reduce inflammation and we can reset your circadian rhythm and we can um, put good mind, you know, thoughts in your in your body, and work that front part of the brain, and plan and organize. Um, then you're going to have a lot of residual income that you wouldn't necessarily have had, and you will then be that much more uh, disciplined about decisions. And I think I don't know what the research is on this, but you probably know as well. Is there's research that the more fatigued you are, the less brain power you have for disciplinary, mm -hmm. you know, disciplinary thoughts. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so that's the same thing. Like the, the more you pay your foundational bills in terms of blood sugar balance, good, healthy nutrients, absorbing them. Um, you know, one of the big ones is they show multitasking um, and, and is actually less productive mm -hmm. because if you can, do one thing and cross it off your list and then do the next thing and cross it off your list you're you're spreading yourself way too thin and your bandwidth is being exceeded and you are not addressing the foundational components which means that there's a demand and supply problem in your body you don't have that extra reserve to be to help your propensity to be a empath for sure so i just would, would want to echo that with you for sure as well. And then as far as um, you said with the, the, the hygienes, like the, the blood sugar hygiene, um, the sleep hygiene, um, the activity, that's the, the other thing I was going to mention epigenetically is we look at all the excitatory neurotransmitters, right? So glutamate, histamines, adrenalines, uh, you know, dopamine, all of these excitatory neurotransmitters are, are typically going to be based on all of those demand and supply be problems being exceeded are going to be released at a higher amount to make up for the lack of energy. So now mm -hmm. you're just overstimulated and it's playing into your propensity to be an empath. Maybe talk a little bit about that, Kelly, in terms of how those excitatory neurotransmitters kind of overlap with, with all of this or what you see with your own personal health and how stress and adrenaline um, can, can really muck up the waters on all of this. Right, absolutely. So if you're, if you're not optimized, if you don't really know, or you're, or maybe you do know, but you're just not optimizing your genetics, let's just take, for example, example, the glutamates, right? A lot of the people that I see who have optimized all those hygiene factors, right? Like all that, and they're really doing well is that they're not getting, they're not getting at that. They're not getting at the crux of that. So it really, it's, it's hard for them to then, if they're not optimizing the glutamates, that they're still running on, you know, they're not, opti I would say we're not optimizing like the, the empathic part of them. So their energy is still like going out to all people, their, their boundaries, you know, they're like the yes mom and they're doing a million different things. Then, then actually, you know, they're living on those glutamates. So they're like, they need those glutamates, but you're just, you're just burning your candle at both ends. Right. So when I try and use like glutamate scavenger from professional health products or really, they kind of, they crash because they were using that as fuel. So, I mean, I, I think that's people using caffeine and, and sugar and things. It's like, if you don't get that, you feel horrible. Now, Let's try. Let's let's turn it around. Let's say you've learned to optimize those all those high those those empathic um, hygienic factors. I like that. 
you know, you're, you're better at managing all the above, maybe then you don't need to be relying on the glutamate to stay awake and stay focused. And it's really pathologically, and you don't have to rely on the caffeine to stay awake and stay focused and, and the sugar. It's just now that your body is more, it's not being robbed of, you know, all of that. And that's where it's like, I really want to emphasize. It's like, there's got to be people out there listening to this who have, they're like, I do my best on sleep. I do my best on a diet. I exercise. I do that. But I come home and I crash. Here's what I want to say to you. How about the relationship hygiene? How about we just check that out? Make sure that's not something because it's so frustrating. You guys, I'm so there with you. It's like, I'm doing everything right. You know, and I'm making gains. Like I, you know, not, not knowing about my empathy. I made tons of gains, but, but really having this piece and recognizing that, and then not again, like you said about the excitatory neurotransmitters and things. I was just, I mean, I had eye, eye twitches, <laughs> but I mean, that's what I had to rely upon, you know, as that, but now I've, I've just done a recent um, new Dutch test and O test, the whole shebang. And I'm, I'm doing much better biochemically. And I, you can't sustain people. You can't sustain on using all those neurotransmitters, you're going to crash even more so. Yeah, that's a great point. And that kind of talks about the disparity between all the stimuli that your body's been used to, to processing. And then all of a sudden you have this drastic fall off and you don't know what to do with it. And then when we say glutamate, like people think about MSG, but anything that's ultimately artificial, like I, I was, I, I'm not, I actually haven't had any alcohol for probably a couple months now. Um, but I find that when I was doing those hard seltzers, right, because they're all filled with glutamate artificial sweeteners, it, it's kind of a double whammy. You have a depressing feeling, but yes, you're, you're also anxious as well. Um, so, so anything that's artificial, um, and there is also showing if you're not getting good organic foods, those glyphosates can really impact your glutamate lowering bacteria and create even more problems. And that's why you love those foods, right? Because they're meant to be addictive and packaged and so forth. So um, I love the term empathic hygiene or emp empathic hygienic factors. That's that's a term that you can, you can just kind of run with. Um, there was something else I was gonna say in there as well with, um, with the fact that, yes, yeah, so, so one of the tools that I would recommend someone to do is for example, like when someone gets, this is what drives me crazy. When someone gets put on, say, a thyroid med and, and that's helpful. Don't get me wrong. It could be helpful as a as a, a quick stop gap, right, to be able to get upstream and work on what's really impacting the body, address that and then take that away. Unfortunately, that's not the MO. The MO is see you later and we'll fill this for the rest of your life, right? Um, but, but the problem is, as that person from a functional medicine per perspective gets better, and the reasons why they had to be on it, put on it in the first place, um, improve, they haven't commensurated their dosing strategy with their improvements. And now they feel over ramped up and, and I'm not licensed as a natural provider to take them off things, but I say to them, Hey, you need to talk to your doctor and you need to be aware. Like if I was your brother, you need to tell them like, Hey, I, I I'm feeling better now. I don't need this. But I think the same thing happens with commensurating our stress load. Meaning like if you have so many variables that you have to process, and you're doing these strategies, you're stabilizing your blood sugar, um, you're getting good circadian rhythm, you're saying no, you're more organized, um, you, you really are, your, your breathing is key, like that breathing, slowing down the breathing. But also all of that will work very effectively to, to lower the amount of stimuli that you have to process where you feel the need to make up for it with ruinous behaviors, number one. And then the other thing I would say is, mental activity, right? Doing something creative, um, doing something physical, that's going to use up a lot of those excitatory neurotransmitters too. And when we put COVID and the news and the media and the restrictions and the not moving, um, it breeds a perfect storm of really making this empathic thing a major hurdle with people that are exhausted and burnt out. Mm -hmm. 
a hundred percent preach. Yeah. That is like spot on. It is yeah. like totally spot on. I knew this conversation would be so enlightening for me. I'm like, well, uh-huh. he's a guest, but I'm like, you're going to end up teaching me more. Oh, well, I don't I- know about that. I mean, I was worried because I was, I wasn't, I didn't listen to the entire book, but you know, I have the background in psychology and unfortunately with my own health challenges and quirks for sure. So, okay. So as far as what you do, Kelly, in terms of How do you now integrate this information into your nutraceutical planning or your one-on-one coaching or just what you do with your, with what you're involved with? How do you incorporate this now for what you do? Sure. So the first step again is, uh, I believe is doing the assessment. So do the assessment, see where you fall. And then, then the second step is forgiveness or grace for yourself just you are who you are and a lot of these things that people think are weird like why can't you be in a a crowd why does a crowd drain you why can't you be you know around uh people who are negative and just not care you know i mean like sorry that's just not you that's not me that's not you so just forgive it and just who you are own who you are you're beautiful you're wonderful you know like some of the things where i started off by saying like i i wasn't it wasn't natural for me to be a mother because I feel like it takes a lot of energy to be a mother in the first place and then to take on all the energy of other people. But so again, I recognize that. And so now I, I'm, I'm having people take assessments, uh, especially the people who I'm like, wow, you have really done everything physiologically for your body. I don't ever skip over emotional health. I'll tell you that right now, but you, I'm just thinking of these people who it's like, they have done everything, but guess what? They're married to a narcissist. They come home every night and that narcissist will take them down energetically. And they're frustrated because they're like, but I can't lose weight. And I'm like, of course you can't lose weight. You're trying to protect yourself from these people, or maybe your best friend is energy draining anyway. So that's what I'll do is I'll just the recognition, right? And then I'll walk, then they'll have this like, oh, sigh of relief. Like, okay, now what do I do? All right, so now what do you do? So what I have done is I've started to really respect these um, empathic fitness factors, you'd call them, right? So I'm really, I'm really trying to do these breathing exercises. My key is that anytime I have to wait for anything. So like I was on the phone with Verizon and I'm like, oh, I'm waiting. I'll start to do some box breathing. I'll start to do, you know, I'm waiting in line, uh, you know, at Target. I'll start to do these, you know, these breathing. So anything is better than nothing, guys. Any sort of mindful breathing. Um, I'm more diligent about getting into water after, especially after I've been slimed, you know, with really like heavy energy. Optimizing sleep has always been on my plate. Um, I will try some of these strategies in that book, which is called Essential Tools for Empaths by Judith Orliff. Um, you know, I'll do the return to sender, you know, just building in these things for myself, my clients that I, that I believe that this is a problem for, for them. But again, I feel like organically when someone recognizes that, that they are this, even like with Joel, I know like you and I are on the same page, like we recognize this and we've always done things to help ourselves. So I, I think people really realize what works for them, but I think they need to be told because we're care, women are caregivers and men can be out in past too, but women are just these caregivers, um, you know, codependent and, and then they, it leads to burnout. You need to recoup, you know, you need to like relearn again, no setting boundaries. These are all very healthy because if you're sick and on the couch and don't feel well, you're not, you're not, you know, you're not your best self. So you're not helping anyone. And that's what we want to do as empaths. We really want to help people. And so the, my last point is that I may have made it sound like being empathic is um, not a gift, but I do believe it really is. You know, I really do believe it is. It's just, you have to learn to, it's just like with any gift, right? You just really have to learn how to use it the most wisely. Yeah, it's a superpower. Excuse yeah. me one second. So sorry. Yeah. Um, Sorry. That's the luxury of having your own office now without a front office person. They knock on the door. But what I was going to say there is, and I will edit that out. What I was going to say is, 
There is a, a question a questionnaire recently that I took. I, it, it's those different personality styles. What's that called? Enneagram. It, it, it was, it was, yes. What's it called again? Enneagram. Enneagram. So I took that and I learned a lot about myself in that, in those answers, Kelly. And it was an aha moment. And it was like less than a month ago, I took that. And, and I think empaths have that, that propensity of putting themselves second, right. And, and doing what they can for other people um, at the expense of themselves and they cut their nose off to spite their faces. It was helpful for me for that because that's where like, well, why am I saying, why am I like saying no to myself? Like I, I'm not having integrity with myself and that makes me be less helpful for them, you know? And so I think that's a huge, uh, huge gift. The other thing I would say is as well as earlier we talked about uh, when Bob Miller says that people can sense, the sharks can sense that in you right and that's where i'd be interested to know like if there was like a add three or four or five more questions in that questionnaire and see like sift out do they tend to gravitate towards narcissists there's 20 um, questions joel and yeah. you are right one of those is can they sniff you out do people just gravitate right especially the ones who really are going to take advantage of you sadly but yeah 100 percent. Right. yeah it's interesting. So as far as um, any any specific formulations, because I'm always loving to talk to you about that, uh, any specific formulations professional health products has that would be, um, I, again, I'm not for supplements as a magic wand, but anything in terms of dialing down the amplification or allowing you just to sort of take time to smell the roses. What have you found in your trick bag of tricks there? Sure. So three things come to mind, really, really simple. And I totally agree with you. We cannot supplement ourselves to health. We, I mean, we, you know, without covering all your other bases, right? You just can't take a handful of pills and be magically better at like nine times out of 10, at least. So number one, our new product called Quai Calm. It is calming. It has a, a branded ingredient in it called Relora. Relora is a mixture of magnolia bark and philodendron, and it has been researched clinically to help the stress response. Quicalm is one of my new best friends. Like we, I, we go everywhere together, me and Quicalm. Um, it also has um, some other medicinal herbs in there that are really calming to the nervous system. Um, then the other is just magnesium, right? Magnesium, 75% of the population is deficient in magnesium. Get a really good form. Take some Epsom salt baths if you can. Topical magnesium, you know, a lot of different forms. We have professional health products used in this bisglycinate from Albion. The studies show when you take it, it actually gets absorbed, which is very helpful. Um, and then, you know what my new one is, is uh, sunflower. Uh, we have a product, sunflower. It's um, PCPEPI. So phosphorylcholine, phosphorylnothetol, and ethanolamine and phosphorylnothetol because it has actually shown um, to be really helpful for cell membranes, so physiologically, and it can help um, brain protection um, and really helping with uh, neurological things. So those are kind of like the three that come to mind. Of course, we have all the glutamate scavengers and things like that, um, and a whole plethora of products, but really quite calm. Oh, that's just that's, that's good. Very yeah, good. I like that idea. Sometimes I'll have people that will just message me that I don't know them from Adam. I say, can you recommend supplements? Like, no, I can't. But yeah. if I were to, I typically had gone with those bioflavonoids um, in, in order to sort of ramp down that whole escalating, ever escalating um, neurotransmitters, inflammatory cytokines. Um, but I do like the concept of you know, if you need something right away and you can get something that's calming, what was the name of the new one that you have? The neuro, uh, neurocom, is that what it's called? Or yeah, it's quite calm, Q U I C A L M. So yeah, yeah. that, and just your, your standard magnesium. And again, these are, this is not, I'm not like suggesting again, someone go out and take this, talk to your doctor. These are doctor, you know, only products. So you have to go through your doctor to get right. them. Yeah. Um, but you know, just really, um, has the studies to back everything that I'm and I'm saying, you know, yeah, we'll put the awesome. link to, to that in the show notes and sort of my website. So, so as far awesome stuff, um, I guess, um, I usually ask uh, this question, but I'll, I'll make it a little more niche to what we talked about today. I usually ask, Hey, if you would have known what you know now back then, as it related to your fatigue, 
Um, if you would have known what you known back then as it relates to your empathic um, double-edged sword, um, what would you have done differently, do you think? Oh, I definitely would have not felt guilty about what my inner, my inner intuition was saying. My inner intuition was saying, you can't be around this sort of energy or you, you know, you need to set better boundaries. I wouldn't have felt guilty about it. I would have been like, I am my best self when I set these boundaries that I intuitively know. And I'll tell you what, I didn't, I didn't listen to my intuition at all. And I ended up bedridden. And I think that was one of the major problems is, you know, is not respecting that. And again, it took a lot of years to get back to where I am because I optimized genetics. I optimized all the lifestyle factors. And then this last piece with respecting this has been life-changing. That's a great, great answer. I love that answer. I, I always say like, it's the, you're listening to your little angel, mm -hmm. you know, like you have to listen to your little angel. If you have a thought that I shouldn't be doing this, or I know this is going to not work out well, or I forgot to check. Now, in my case, it's not always good when you think you left the garage door open every single time you left the house, but that's not so much a little angel. That's just your neurosis coming through. But no, I would say though, if you listen to your little angel more often than not, you're going to be congruent with that empath uh, propensity. That's an awesome answer. So where do we learn more about what you do and, and find out about you, Kelly? Sure. So I am on uh, Instagram. Uh, if you type in my name, I'm on Facebook. I have a big following on Facebook. I have a Twitter. I have a website, drkellyhalderman.com. It's under construction right now. So taking a little longer than I thought, but um, I like to put like all kinds of resources that I find helpful there. Um, and then I honestly, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out there, Joel live. I think we should talk about the Enneagram. I really think we should come back and, and do that. Cause it was, you and I are the same. It was so helpful. It feels like kind of the same, um, you know, playing field as, as the empathic and, and people can learn about who they are. Um, and again, that little angel then may more, may mean more to them when they figure that out. Too. Yeah, and for sure. That. We'll do part four for sure. I, I definitely <laughs> will. We'll put that up. We'll put that. I'm writing it down right now. So put that awesome. out if you don't want me back on, but I just thought that no, that's really great. Awesome. That's great. I, I think it's good. I mean, I don't know enough about it except that I took the test, but yeah. I think we could talk about um, what it means and being able to, and I love the way that the new health model is headed towards is having all these other, I guess, intangible uh, mm -hmm. emphasis on how we live our life every day and, and our own tendencies and behaviors and quirks and, and to love them and not judge them and have them work for you. And it's not being, it's being selfish, not it's being, I think it's being selfish to be unselfish, right? You know, and, and if you're, if you're going to be, um, if you're going to, be more into yourself or be aware of yourself ultimately that is um being more unselfish i guess is a bit absolutely yeah so anyways i appreciate your time kelly and um, i look forward to part two and i wish you continued success in all your endeavors as well all right thank you dr joel have a great day thank you kelly